So the time has come to really jump into the, perhaps the most mathematical part of, of this course, and that is uh, moving to the frequency domain when analyzing circuits. So I thought I'd state up front what the objectives of all this is, what the objectives are, and uh, the objectives uh, are to analyze circuits to know uh, the transfer function, the, the output versus the input, of any circuit, and by that I mean not just fixed frequency AC circuits or DC circuits, but circuits with arbitrary uh, frequency functions. And what's more, we want to quickly be able to sketch the transfer function in the frequency domain, uh, and this style of plotting is known as a Boda plot. And uh, basically we're going to plot the amplitude of the uh, gain as a function of frequency and the phase of that as a function of frequency. So first we want to answer the question, uh, why, why do we do things in the frequency domain at all? Uh, we started by just solving differential equations in the time domain, and why do we care about the frequency domain? Well, uh, transforming to the frequency domain is, of course, just a step of, of solving the differential equation in the time domain. Uh, but it's easier to think of things in the frequency domain because at a fixed uh, frequency, uh, the response of the circuit is often just a complex number, a single complex number. In other words, a magnitude and a phase uh, in the frequency domain. Uh, and so we can move away from thinking of differential equations to thinking of uh, algebraic equations with complex numbers. Uh, finally, uh, or one other reason, is that uh, for any function in the time domain, any function we can imagine putting in, we can break that function up into a bunch of different frequency components that we add together. Uh, that's uh, what's known as Fourier analysis. And, uh, and so, because this is true, we're going to want to transform uh, our time domain function into a bunch of frequency domain components. And we do that either with the Fourier transform or the Laplace transform to go from, from our time domain, time varying function, to a set of frequencies in the in frequency space. In this class, we're going to use the Laplace transform uh, because uh, we'll be able to see the transients of the time domain as well as the uh, the steady components. Fourier analysis uh, will give us only uh, things that are true at all time, no transients, only the solution uh, that is there after all the transients are gone. I'll begin my discussion of the frequency domain with uh, an example of how you make a square wave out of uh, some of different sine waves. Uh, so the general formula for this, if you, I'm just stating the result of a uh, Fourier analysis, uh, the square wave function as a function of time, and by this I actually want the function that goes from minus one to plus one with with quick variations. Uh, as a function of t, and the function that I actually want has a period of one as well, so uh, so if we think of that as seconds, in the first half second I'm at one plus one volt, at the, at the from half a second to one second I'm at minus one volt. And so the result of Fourier analysis is that I just add up this, I have sine waves, and I have odd values of the frequency, uh, or here I've put it in terms of the wavelength, uh, as a function of, of time, uh, and uh, and then I have to normalize each by that odd number. So I can imagine adding, you know, if I have a frequency of one of my square wave, then of course I'm going to have the broad frequency is the same frequency, but it, but it's you know it has its rounded edges, uh, and that's the term here where n equals zero. And so you see, if I have n equals zero, I just have two pi t over lambda. Here are lambdas is one, so I get one cycle in one period, and the amplitude is one over one, so one as well, so that's drawn in there. The next term is when n equals one, and that gives me three, so I'm going to have three oscillations in every of my main periods, so one, two, three, and uh, I'm going to only have a third the amplitude, so here I come up to one third and go down to one third, and you see what this does when I add the two together, I take off here, because I'm down, uh, and 
so I make a more square-like thing. It's not so peaked in the middle. And I add a little to the edges to make it a little sharper cut. Uh, I can then go and a, a third term. N is now 2, and so I get 5, so I get an extra cycle in every one, and I have, I'm have down a little bit in amplitude. Now I make these corners even sharper and and uh, push this point back up a little bit. I had brought it a little too much down, and uh, and so I make it even square uh, set there. And the fourth term, which is 7, has 7 cycles, and now you can see that I'm going up because they they all add in the beginning, and then it it moves around, and then on the second half it it goes down to the negative thing, and as I add an infinite number of terms, I'll get basically something that goes from zero to one uh, minus one to one every uh, period. So uh, now we have to consider. Uh, the kinds of frequencies we have in our frequency domain. And so, in the time domain, we just have a real value t for the time, but the frequency domain variable can be complex. Uh, so, if I have a pure frequency, uh, in other words, a sine wave or a cosine, uh, then my frequency domain variable is, in fact, purely imaginary. Uh, I'm going to have a j omega, in other words. However, and we use that already when we solve the second order differential equations, uh, but uh, I can also have a real part of that which indicates either a growing or a shrinking exponential. So I can imagine that my current is a function of e to the st now, and s has a real part sigma and an imaginary part omega. And when I plug this in, now I can, I can break up S into two parts, as I've, as I've shown here. And because I can add the, if I'm adding in the exponential, I'm, I'm multiplying exponentials. So I can break that into, here's my exponential decay or, or rise and my purely sinusoidal part. And now I can imagine plotting different S's in the complex plane. So if I purely imaginary, in other words, I'm on the imaginary axis, and I have an S there, I have a pure sine or cosine function. And if I have no imaginary part, but I have a sigma, then if I, sigma is negative, I have a, a exponential decay, or it's a shrinking function of time. And if it's positive, I have a growing exponential in time. And then I can imagine an arbitrary solution, uh, where, for instance, over here I have a damped sinusoidal uh, behavior uh, that we saw when we had resistors and capacitors and inductors all together. Notice that uh, when I'm over here, uh, anywhere over here, I'm going to have that, that damped nature of it. And if I'm over here, I'm going to have things that grow. So if I'm going to design a circuit that I don't want to grow, then I have to, have to avoid having S in this region. So the impedance values that we had are, work fine in this system. Uh, Remember the impedance of the capacitor is 1 over j omega s, a uh, j omega c, and I just replaced j omega with, with s, and so the impedance of a capacitor is just 1 over cs, impedance of an inductor is just ls, and I can go back and forth between current and uh, voltage as in the normal way. Okay, so now I'm ready to define what I really mean by a transfer function. What I do is I imagine that my uh, my circuit is a black box and I have an input port and an output port. Though often I'll just have an input voltage and, and current and, and the other side of the ports will be just connected to ground, like so. Uh, and so I can imagine doing four things. I can imagine finding V out with respect to V in. Take the ratio of that, I get a voltage gain. I can imagine finding the current out with respect to the current in, in which case I'm calculating a current gain. Find, uh, and then I can also imagine finding the output voltage in terms of the input current. And so if I divide V out by, by I in, I get something with units of impedance, but the voltage and current not being measured in the same place means I don't have an impedance, I have a trans-impedance, which is like a gain, it's just it doesn't have, it's not units 
unitless like you expect to gain. Finally, I can I can switch the i and the v. I can find the current out given a v in, and that's a transadmittance. Admittance being one over uh, the impedance. So let's consider an example, um, and that's going to be our inverting op-amp circuit, uh, which I show here. And rather than having the resistors, I'm going to put two arbitrary impedances there and, and calculate the gain of that. The transfer function in this case is the gain V out over V in, both with respect to ground. And we already calculated that. We know what it is. It's minus Z2 over Z1. Uh, but And so now I want to consider when V in is in the frequency space at some fixed function of uh, fixed frequency. So imagine that I replace Z1 with a resistor and a capacitor in sequence, and I just leave Z2 as an R2. Now I calculate what those impedances are at a particular fixed frequency S, and I have this, right? The, the inductances in sequence just add, so I put R1 plus 1 over Cs, and R2 is just R2. And now I plug Z2 and Z1 into the equation here, and I get just this. Now I don't like to have 1 over Cs in the denominator, so I multiply through by Cs, and I get minus R2 Cs, R1 plus R1 Cs. From this I can, I can factor out the minus R2 over R1 that I might have expected, and then I have S over something with units of 1 over time, and S again. So, um, so my gain is in the form of a ratio of two polynomials, and the numerator, I just have S as the polynomial. In the denominator, I have a constant plus S, uh, and so we'll always be able to analyze the, uh, the gain or the transimpedance or the transfer function in general as a ratio of two polynomials in S.